Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for being here today on uh, what is a nice, bright, apparently, uh, Sunday morning. I think somebody said spring started, but I don't, I don't keep up with these things, but I think it has. So good to see you all this morning. Thank you for being here. Thank you for choosing to worship with us, those of you who are here in the room, those of you who are watching at home as well. Uh, appreciate you being here. There's many places you could be. The fact that you are here is something that we appreciate very much and do not take for granted. Uh, let me say what everybody in the room is probably thinking about. Uh, is we're going to think this week about what to do about all these ribbons and stuff. We're starting to fill up, as you can tell. And uh, so we'll, uh, we'll do some thinking and talking about that this week. But uh, anyway, it's that th things are starting to get better. Many of you have gotten the second shot. Uh, and we're starting to see families back who haven't been back in all of this. And so uh, that's a good thing. And uh, I haven't gotten the shot yet, but I figure at some point they'll get so desperate they'll open it up to anybody <laughs> at that point. So I'll do that. <laughs> Hey, I want you all to pray about something as we are approaching Easter uh, coming in the next few weeks. Pray about the Annie Armstrong Easter offering for North American Missions, uh, church plants in the United States and in Canada. Uh, that offering is one of the most important we take up as Southern Baptists. And so go back and look. See what, what you gave last year, maybe even the year before, and, and pray about whether or not the Lord would lead you to give a little bit more this year. There's some great uh, church plants going on uh, all throughout the country and in parts of the country where the gospel is really... Um, <laughs> kind of barren, like there's just not a lot of gospel witness in those areas, whether it be the Pacific Northwest or parts of the Northeast or parts of Canada, and so I have a, a friend who's in Toronto, and the Lord has just done a great thing there, but it's just this massive, unchurched city, and so to be able to support those things uh, through that Annie Armstrong offering, so begin to pray about that. I know you already have, and uh, I appreciate that. Well, guys, let me pray for us, and then uh, Bill will come and lead us in a song. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together to worship you. I pray during this hour you would fill us with your spirit, Lord, that you would just empower us to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Well, let's begin this morning by singing Holy, Holy, Holy. Would you stand as we sing, please? church. Good morning, guests. Uh, This morning, I want to draw your attention to something out of John chapter 2. So we know that Jesus' first recorded miracle was at the wedding of Cana, changing water into wine. But this morning, I want to draw your attention to the servants that Jesus directed in this this story. Um, Starting in verse 5, it says, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. And then we know the the rest of the story that turned into wine, went to the master of the feast. It was the better wine that Jesus has made than the best wine they had already, you know, put out. Uh, And it was an incredible thing, a miraculous, you know, event. But Jesus was perfectly capable as God in human flesh, the creator of the universe who spoke the, the universe into existence, he could have easily spoken the jars into existence and the water inside them and turned them to wine himself, but he chose to use people in the working of his miracle. And oftentimes, you know, sometimes God does get us out of our comfort zone and, and lead us to do something new in the way of serving him for his kingdom and kingdom expansion, but don't discredit or discount the everyday occurrence of God using you to do something that you already are familiar with for the sake of his kingdom, something that you already may be comfortable with. And, and it says that they didn't fill it up halfway, they didn't fill it up most of the way, but they filled it up to the brim, just as he had said, and then they drew some out and took it to the master of the banquet, and he used them to do something incredible. So this week, I would encourage you to look for opportunities in your everyday routine, your everyday life, to do something that you may 
already know how to do, something that you're already familiar with and, and comfortable with to the glory of God, where God may be leading you and nudging you to do something that may be simple to us or seem simple to us that God can use in a powerful way to point people to him. Thank you, Adam. Let's uh, turn our attention to another great hymn, and I love a great testimony hymn, and that's what this is. Jesus is all the world to me, and as you sing these words today, just do a self-check. Are these words uh, true for me, or are they not? I hope they are, and if not, pay close attention to Brother John's message today. Would you stand, please? Good to see you this morning. Uh, let me remind you that following the prayer, we're going to invite our children to go to the children's church. So those who are uh, age four years old through fourth grade, welcome to meet us in the back of the sanctuary, and we will go from there to the children's area. So I know you're excited about that. We're looking forward to that time. Why don't we pray together as a church? Father, we do love you this morning. Uh, Father, you are our God. You're our sustainer. Uh, Father, you're the one who holds us up. No matter what comes at us each and every day, sometimes, uh, many times a day, uh, the things that we face, we know it's you uphold us by the word of your power. Father, we thank you for that. Thank you for the opportunity to worship together as your people. Uh, I just want to thank you for the evidence of your work in our lives and in our world. Father, we want to see the evidence of that here today in our service as we worship you to see the way that you move powerfully in and through our lives today. We know that's only possible by the Holy Spirit and through your word. And so I pray that you empower Brother John as he preaches your word today by the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that you'd help us to respond in obedience and to glorify you in all that we do. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, choir. Nothing quite like hearing scripture in song, so appreciate that very much. Hey, let me give you all uh, a little bit of logistical news and instruction as you're thinking about, and we're thinking about Easter coming up in a few weeks. Easter's going to look a little different this year. Um, this will actually be my first Easter in person. Uh, my first, my, you know, last year, my first Easter as pastor, we were still on, we were in lockdown and we were online only. So it's kind of an odd thing. Uh, but this year we're going to be here for Easter unless something weird happens between now and the next few weeks. Uh, but normally in the past, what has happened at the church is that we would have two services. We would have, you know, during, I think, I think it was a service and then Sunday school and then another service, I think is how, how it worked. We're not going to do that this year uh, because we we are going to have the orchestra here, and the choir is going to be uh, singing and doing their, their Easter uh, musical on Sunday morning. They're gonna, that'll be half the service. The other half of the service will be me. I'll come and preach after they finish up, but we'll have, you know, we'll have the orchestra. The platform will be full with the folks that we have come in and play for us and all that. So because of that, we're going to do one service on Easter at our normal time. We'll have Sunday school like normal, we'll have, and then our normal time we'll have our worship service. So It'll look a little different with everybody up here with the instruments, with the choir singing, and then I'll preach. But what we're going to do is we're going to have an overflow room in the gym. Uh, we don't really know what to expect as far as Easter goes because, you know, everybody was in the tradition of sometimes folks, you know, everybody showed up on Easter, but churches didn't have Easter in person last year. And so we don't know if the people, if our Christmas and Easter only people will show back up right? And if you're one of those people, you're probably not because you're watching today. Uh, we just don't know what to expect. So here's what I want you to think about. Those of you who are, are here every week and are faithful and, and are able to be here, I want you to consider, if needed, I want you to consider going to the gym uh, in the overflow so guests that we have can be in here uh, in the sanctuary. I don't know how necessary that's going to be. We're just trusting the Lord in that. But just think about that and pray about it and, and be willing uh, if it's needed on, uh, on Easter Sunday. But that's the plan. So we'll be in here and there will also be an overflow room uh, in the gym with the, the service on the screen. So that's what's happening on Easter, which is that two weeks away? Is that when that is? Y'all, the year is flying by. So there's a, uh, there's a song that we sing. I think this is mainly an invitation song. I'm not going to sing it. Don't, don't worry. But well, let me read the first verse to you. The, the song is Living for Jesus. And here's the, the first verse. Living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free. This is a pathway of, do you know what it says? Blessing for me. That's exactly right. Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. And I, I want to ask this question, simply this, what happens when we live for the Lord? What happens when you and I actually commit our lives to live for him fully? And so I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Haggai chapter 2 and verse 10. Haggai chapter 2 in verse 10. We're going to wrap up the book of Haggai today. And uh, it's been a fun series. Several of you have talked about it and, and how, how you've enjoyed it. I know that I have. It's just three little sermons as we go through. But let's remind ourselves of what we've seen uh, before we jump into the text today. And in chapter 1, verses 1 through 15, the, the people are confronted by God through Haggai and they're told you need to get back to work you need to to rebuild the temple because they had let it just lay there for about 16 years or so they they had laid the foundation and then there had been pressure from the outside and they had stopped because they were afraid and so they hadn't been hadn't been working on it and ultimately they begin to work again they respond and things get going and then in chapter 2 verses 1 through 9 the Lord brings some further encouragement to them and he tells them I'm with you in this I, and he reminds them my spirit's going to abide with you and I am with you. And in our verses today Haggai chapter 2 verses 10 through 23 which will finish up the book he's going to kind of go back remind them of where they were before he began to intervene with Haggai and then tell them what it's going to look like going forward. So in the first part, it's going to be a reminder of what it looks like when God's people don't live for him. But then we'll remind ourselves of the context and the fact that they are living for him. And then he says, because of that, here's what it looks like. And I've already told you what that answer is when I read that first verse. And it's simply that he blesses us. 
So Haggai chapter 2, verses 10 through 23, uh, that'll finish up the chapter. Here's what it says. On the 24th of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priest for a ruling. If a man carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches bread with this fold or cooked food, wine, oil, or any other food, will it become holy? The priest answered, no. Then Haggai said, well, if one, if one who is unclean from a corpse touches any of these, will the latter become unclean? And the priest answered, it will become unclean. Then Haggai said, so is this people, and so is the nation before me, declares the Lord, and so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. But now, do consider from this day onward, before one stone was placed on another in the temple of the Lord, from that time when one came to a grain heap of 20 measures, there'd be only 10. And when one came to a wine vat to draw 50 measures, there'd be only 20. I smote you in every work of your hands with blasting wind, mildew, and hail. Yet you did not come back to me, declares the Lord. Do consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day when the temple of the Lord was founded, consider. Is the seed still in the barn? Even including the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree, it is not born fruit. Yet from this day on, I will bless you. Then the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah. I'm going to shake the earth, the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow the thrones of kingdoms and destroy the power of the kingdoms of the nations. And I will overthrow the chariots and their riders and the horses and their riders will go down. Everyone by the sword of another. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will make you Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant, declares the Lord. And I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. December the 18th, 520 B.C. is when these two prophecies were given. It, it, the, but the book of Haggai is wonderful. It, we actually know the very days that the things take place. We, we started out on August the 29th, 520 B.C., and then we moved to September the 21st, and then October the 17th. And now some time has passed, and we're into December. So let's go back to verse 10 and see what we see as we think through this idea of what happens if you and I will simply live for the Lord. Verse 10 again says, On the 24th of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet. So December the 18th, 520 B.C., it's, it's that final day that God is going to speak through Haggai. Now understand that it, at this time, in fact, if your Bible's like mine, the way it's divided, on the very next page is the book of Zechariah. Zechariah has also just recently started his ministry. They are now running parallel to one another in dealing with the nations because they, they, they prophesied and, and obeyed the Lord and followed him at the same time. So the book of Zechariah has now launched off as well. So here he is, and here's what he says in verse 11. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priest for a ruling. And he's going to give two examples here. And it's a little hard to follow, admittedly, but I, I think we can make a little bit of sense out of it. Verse 12, he says, If a man carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches bread with this fold or cooked food, wine, oil, or any other food, will it become holy? The priest answered, No. The idea here is that, that the, the meat that was set aside for the priest, the meat of the sacrifice, where they got a portion of that, the question is, will the holiness of that meat, of that sacrifice, will it transfer? And the answer is, no, it won't. Holiness isn't going to transfer. That thing is holy, but that, it's not going to make something else holy. Well, then he gives the opposite example in verse 13. Then Haggai said, well, if one who is unclean from a corpse touches any of these, will the latter become unclean? And the priest answered, well, it will become unclean. So he's talking here about the fact that, that holiness isn't so much transferred, but uncleanness and unholiness is. And he's talking to God's people. And here, here's the basic idea. You and I need to understand that when the world begins to infiltrate, it's going to draw us away from following the Lord. 
The only thing that can impact the world for holiness is if, if people in the world, individuals in it, will repent of their sins and place their faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. You and I as individuals can't make the world holier. Only Christ can do that. But the world can corrupt us. It can corrupt God's people. And that's what he's talking about here. He's trying to get them to understand that in the past, because ultimately he's going to bring it back down to, but I'm going to, going to bless you from this day forward. In the past, they had followed the, the pagans around them. They had been very sinful, and ultimately that led to God rejecting them. Look at verse 14. Then Haggai said, so is this people, and so is the nation before me, declares the Lord, and so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. The nation had fallen into horrible sin. They, they were doing all kinds of things. You go back and read First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. You, you read those, those histories. And you find that the nation of Israel were acting just like the pagan nations around them, to the point and this is hard to fathom, except there's nothing new under the sun. Satan has no new tricks to the point where they were sacrificing children to the god Moloch. See, Satan doesn't have anything new. Now we just, it's, it's abortion. It's the same thing. It's, it's still, it's something that's evil. It's something that's pagan. It's, it's that influence. They had gone that far. And because of that, they found themselves in exile for 70 years in Babylon. In fact, let me read it to you. 2 Kings, chapter 23, beginning in verse 26. Here's what it says. However, the Lord did not turn from the fierceness of his great wrath, which with, with which his anger burned against Judah, because of all the provocations with which Manasseh had provoked him. That was, one of, that was the wicked king, one of the many wicked kings of Judah. The Lord said, I will remove Judah also from my sight as I have removed Israel. I will cast off Jerusalem, this city which I have chosen, and the temple of which I said my name shall be there. And that's exactly what happened. Beginning in 605 B.C. and ultimately culminating in 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar would come several times to Jerusalem. He would take people away. That, that's where we get the beginning of the book of Daniel. But ultimately in 586 he destroys the temple. And that's why they find themselves in the position that they are, that they had to rebuild it. In fact, Isaiah describes it this way. In Isaiah chapter 1, verses 13 through 15, listen to what God says about his people. He says, bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. And because the nation had become so sinful and so wicked, in 586 B.C., they had been, they had been taken to Babylon. And they spent about 70 years there, outside of the nation. They spent 70 years in captivity. And, and ultimately, they get to go back. And when they get back, they, they, they're all excited. They begin to rebuild the temple, and they lay the foundation, and they let the pressures around them cause them to stop. And then time passes, and that's where God then uses Haggai to get them to start working again and get them to start building the temple. But the nation had this in their past. They had, they had strayed from the Lord, and because of that, there had been just been horrible consequences. But he begins to work towards something here. Look at verse 15. But now, do consider, and if you underline in your Bible, that word consider is, is one of the most important words in Haggai. It means to, to set your heart. He says it over and over again. He says, but now do consider from this day onward, before one stone was placed on another in the temple of the Lord. So they're still working. From that time when one came to, to grain, to, to a grain heap of 20 measures, there would only be 10. And when one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there would only be 20. I smote you and every work of your hands with a blasting wind, mildew and hail, yet you did not come back to me declares the Lord. Now he's echoing back and reminding them of how the book of Haggai started. In fact, let's look at it. Haggai chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. Look how the book starts. He says, Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your 
ways. You sow much, but harvest little. You eat, but there's not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there's not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns, earns wages to put into a purse with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains, bring wood, and rebuild the temple, that I may be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, but behold, it comes to little. When you bring it home, I blow it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house which lies desolate while each of you runs to his own house. Therefore, because of you, the sky has withheld its dew and the earth has withheld its produce. I called for a drought on the land, on the mountains, on the grain, on the new wine, on the oil, on what the ground produces, on men, on cattle, and all the labor of your hands. That's where they found themselves when we come to the book of Haggai. They had been back in the land. They had been exiled because of their sin, and then they were back in the land, and they were neglecting the very thing that represented God's presence among his people. Remember, that's what the temple is. The temple is a picture of Christ. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. All the sacrifices that take place at the temple pointing to the blood atonement, all of that had been neglected. And they had built their own houses and they would worried about themselves and their own lives and all those things that we get distracted from. And God uses Haggai to get them back on track. So now they're back on track. Here's what he says, verse 18. Do consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day when the temple of the Lord was founded, consider. Is the seed still in the barn? The answer to that is no, they just planted. Even including the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, the olive tree, it has not borne fruit, so the harvest hasn't come yet. But then here's where he's going. Yet from this day on, I will bless you. Why? Because they had changed. They had done what God had called them to do, what Haggai had challenged them to do, what Zechariah was challenging them to think about. They had begun to serve the Lord. They were rebuilding the temple. They were serving him. They were following him. They were rebuilding the thing that represented their salvation, that picture of Jesus. They were focusing on that again. And God says, you remember what it was like before? You remember how you went and you were looking for, for 20 things and you found 10. You remember it was like you had a, had a hole in your bank account, stuff that just went away. The money just, just flowed out as fast as it came in. You remember how things were bad. You remember, he, it's not like that anymore because you have obeyed me. And he says, because of that, because of that, I will bless you. Now, I don't know about you, but I would a whole lot rather live a life being blessed by God than live a life in rebellion, right? I mean, that just makes sense. I mean, he talks about the consequences of their rebellion, the fact that their harvest was weak and their, their finances were messed up. I mean, all these things were happening. And yet the whole book of, of Haggai, they get right with him, and now he's saying, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to be with you. Now hear me on this. These blessings, this idea that God will bless us if we live for him and if we serve him, this is not health, wealth, and prosperity stuff. Here's what I mean by that. He tells them, I'm going to bless you. But in all those blessings, they still remain under foreign rule. In all of those blessings, they're going to have a little bit of time in between the Old and New Testament where where they're on their own and and the Maccabees, you know, run out those who are opposed to them. They rededicate the temple and you get Hanukkah and all that sort of neat stuff. But for the rest of of their existence as a nation they're going to be under rule by somebody else by the time you get to when the new test you know AD 70 or so they they have the the war with Rome and the temples destroyed again so it's not like suddenly life was just all you know wonderful and everything went great he's talking about them and their relationship with him how even though the world is still difficult even though things aren't perfect he is going to bless his people because they're serving him So that doesn't necessarily mean when you and I serve the Lord and we get right with him, it doesn't mean suddenly everything's going to be great again. It doesn't mean that that your diagnosis is going to change. It doesn't mean that suddenly your bank account is going to fill up. But here's what it does mean. It means that you and I know he is constantly with us. And according to his glory and according to his means, he is going to bless us. Not unlike what Adam was talking about earlier, where in the very little, the things that we don't even think about. He may use us to to bring glory and honor to him. See, guys, it's about the little things. It's about simply deciding every day that today 
I am going to serve the Lord. And when we do that, he will bless us in ways that we can't even anticipate because ultimately he's going to do it through Jesus because notice how the book ends. It ends kind of odd, right? You read it and you're like, that's it because he gives this sort of prophecy about Zerubbabel at the end and then the book sort of stops. And, and how is this connected up with what's, what he's just told them? Well, go to verse 20. Then the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. So the same day. He had, he had, two, he had two sermons that day. Verse 21. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah. And by the way, I'm going to hate that we're going to be done with Haggai. I love saying the word Zerubbabel. I'm just, I'm, I'm going to... I'm telling you, uh, I'm just going to hate to miss that. Uh, speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow the thrones of kingdoms and destroy the power of the kingdoms of the nations. And I will overthrow the chariots and their riders and the horses and their riders will go down, every one by the sword of another. Now, do you hear the, the idea of chariots and riders and horses and riders? That should remind us as people of the word. He's using that, that evocative language of the exodus, of the Red Sea, of the army coming, all that picture. Because that's what the exodus is. It's a picture of so many things. Right? It's a picture of salvation. They were in slavery to Egypt, just like we were in slavery to sin. They have been rescued. They've been redeemed out of that slavery. They're now following him. At the same time, all the plagues very much point to the end of time. You know, you read through the plagues, it's like reading the book of Revelation. I mean, there's so much going on in, in, the, in the book of Exodus. And so he's using that language to remind his people, to re remind me and you, that ultimately God is in control of history. And notice what he says. He gets real specific. In verse 23, he says, On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant, declares the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord. Now, here's the interesting thing about, about good old Zerubbabel. He just disappears off the scene. We don't really know. A whole lot about him After, once you get outside of the book of Haggai and Zechariah and you know Ezra and those books he just sort of drifts away like we don't even know when he died we don't know what what God did with him after this what God is doing here with Zerubbabel however is using him as a type of Christ because ultimately, that's how God blesses us. He tells them back in verse 19, Yet from this day on I will bless you. And now he's talking about the end of time. And in that, he's beginning to talk about Zerubbabel, that ancestor of Jesus, that picture of Christ. Because remember who Zerubbabel is. He is in the line of David. If they had a king at this time, he would be it. He was the grandson of the last guy to sit on the throne as king. But there's a little word in here that's so important in verse 23. He calls him my servant. That's a key word in the Old Testament. In fact, Isaiah uses it over and over again to speak of the suffering servant, to speak of Jesus. Let me show you a few verses. Isaiah 42, 1 through 4 says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. And then the, the most famous the suffering servant passages in Isaiah 53. I won't read the whole thing, but I'll read to you the, 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 one of the latter parts. Isaiah 53, 10 and 11. Here's what it says about Jesus and about what he did for us. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, and then here's the phrase, my servant will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. 
That's what Jesus did for us. He bore our iniquities. And by, by Haggai, God, through Haggai, taking Zerubbabel and saying, I'm going to use you. You're, you're going to be up there. I'm going to use it as a signet ring, as, as, a, as a sign of royalty. And I'm going to do amazing things from you. And it's going to be related to the end of time and how all of history is going to be wrapped up. You and I know from the rest of Scripture, ultimately, he's pointing us to the thing they're rebuilding, to what it represents, pointing us to Christ. And the fact that he bore our iniquities and the fact that he is victorious. He talks about that day, the, the day of the Lord, often how the Old Testament talks about the end of time. And here's what you and I need to know. The reason that God is going to bless us when we serve him, the reason we know that God is on our side, the reason we know that all of history is going to work out for the glory of God is because we can know Jesus. Because he died for you and he died for me and he was buried and he rose again on the third day and he's going to return one day. That's what we're anticipating. Do you know when the end times started? Do you know when the things that he's talking about in, in verses, verse, verse 22, the overthrow of thrones and kingdoms and all that, do you know when the end times began? The moment Jesus walked out of the tomb. We've been in the end times since Easter morning. And, and it's a done deal. It's just, just it, it, in fact, Scripture talks about it as if it's already completed because it's God in, in complete control of history. And because of that, because of that blessing, because of who Christ is, if you and I will serve him, he will bless us. He will be with us. He will use us to bring glory and honor to his name. So back to the question, what happens when we live for the Lord? That's a simple answer. He blesses us. He blesses us. That's a fairly generic term, I know. Because he does it differently in each of our lives and in different parts of our life. I mean, I think about, you know, just there, there have been times in, in our life, in the ministry, where he has blessed us financially. Like, you know, when you're, when you're a young preacher and, and, you know, you're pastor in a small church and have about 15 kids like we do and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Sometimes you're broke. And the Lord just provides. And he blesses us that way. He's blessed us by bringing great friends into our life. He's blessed us by watching over our family. He's blessed us through these. And, and wherever you are in life, those blessings are different. There are some of you in this room that, that, that something that would bless you and something that would mean the world to you is, is not what it, it wouldn't do that same thing for me. Or for others in the room. Because God knows you as an individual. He knows what you need. And if you and I will serve him. If we will live for him. He will bless us. It doesn't mean everything's going to be great. But it means it's going to be used for him. And for his glory. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the, the Westminster um, shorter catechism. That's more of a reform sort of Presbyterian thing. But you may know some of it. The first question of the, the Westminster Shorter, Shorter Catechism is this. What is the chief end of man? And the answer that you learn is man's chief end is to glorify God. And then the second part of the answer is, and to enjoy him forever. And that's what it means to be blessed by God. is to enjoy him and to know him. And to know that he's going to watch over us and bless us. But notice why the guarantee comes. The guarantee comes to God's people here in Haggai because they began to do what he called them to do. They hadn't been doing it for 16 years, and they finally began to respond to God, and they started to rebuild the temple, and they began to serve him. And he says, okay, I'm going to bless you. If you and I are not walking with the Lord as a believer, if you have allowed the uncleanness of the world, the thing he was talking about in the first part of the paragraph, if you have allowed that to draw you away from him, to, to impact your walk with him as a believer, you cannot expect to have those same blessings. You cannot expect the, the Lord to just begin to bless you in ways like you couldn't imagine if you are disobeying him in every way you can think of. But if you and I will serve him, if we will repent of those things that are contrary to his word, if we will seek those opportunities to serve him and to honor him with our thoughts and with our speech and with our actions and use our spiritual gifts, we know he will bless us. Whatever those blessings are that you need in your life. Often it's things that we would have never thought of because we get with the things we think we need, we don't actually need, but God knows what we need. You almost have to get on the other side of it to recognize it. But we have to walk 
with him. And it comes through knowing Jesus. All these things he talks about with Zerubbabel in verses 20 through 23 point to the fact that our Lord and Savior is ultimately and eternally victorious. And we get to know him. So here's the challenge today. If you've repented of your sins and placed your faith in Jesus Christ, my question is, are you living for him? Or have you allowed the world or your own flesh or your own mind to draw you away? Is there something today that, that, that's hindering your walk with the Lord? We all need to be blessed. There's not a person in this room that doesn't need to be blessed by God because we've all got stuff going on. Your life might be great right now, but maybe, you know, you've got a, a child or a grandchild or, a, you know, a sibling or somebody that things are just, just terrible. And you need to be blessed by God so you can minister to them. Walk with the Lord. Serve him. Live a life that honors him. And know that in the midst of that, he's going to bless you. And he's going to watch over you. But hear me. Hear me in this. There is no guarantee, zero guarantee of blessing if you don't know Jesus. You have to repent of your sins and place your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. Call on the name of the Lord and be saved. Then, then, you can live for him and receive his blessings. So if today you've never been saved, you've never given your life to Christ, you can come. You can repent of your sins and place your faith in Jesus as Lord. To those of you at home who are watching, if you want to talk about what it means to follow Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've never done that, send me an email to john, J-O-H-N, at mycbcc.org. I know it's a mouthful, but that's what it is. J-O-H-N at mycbcc.org. We can talk about what it means to know Christ as your Lord and Savior. Your other option is if you're watching on Facebook, you can just send us a Facebook message. Uh, the only people that will see it are the staff, and, and we can respond to that as well. And for those of you who are watching who do know Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you will simply live for him, live a life that brings glory and honor to him, he'll take care of you, and he will bless you, and he will use you to bring glory to to his name and use you in your life to show the world what it means to follow Christ. So we're going to log off for those of you who are watching here in just a second and go to a, a time of response in the room. But send us an email, send us a Facebook message. But ultimately know this, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can be blessed by God if you will simply live a life that honors him. Thank you guys for watching, those of you who, who are watching today. Appreciate it.